The women's rights movement in America was directly influenced by the work of the abolitionist movement. Nearly all women's rights advocates supported abolition. However, not all abolitionists supported a woman's right to engage herself in political activity. Responding to the attempted silencing of women at anti-slavery conventions and the expectation that they stay at home caring for their children, women's rights advocates like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott organized the first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848 and asked American women to consider whether they too felt in some sense enslaved. By 1863, the abolitionist and women's rights advocate Sojourner Truth had spent more than 20 years speaking against slavery, and her health had seriously declined. At the time President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, she was living in a basement in Battle Creek, Michigan. But news of the proclamation seemed to rejuvenate her health, and she mustered her strength to continue her campaign for justice. I mean to live till I'm a hundred years old, if it please God, and see my people all free. Born Isabella Baum Free in Ulster County, New York in 1797 as a Dutch-speaking slave, she labored for four masters. In 1827, Isabella took flight after her final master reneged on a promise to grant her the freedom she had toiled for. She migrated to New York City in 1828, a year after the state completed the official emancipation of its slaves. In the city, she worked as a housekeeper, joined reform movements, and associated with an ill-fated millennialist spiritual community. Referring to the crowded city as a second Sodom, she left New York City in 1843. Upon her departure, she informed her landlady that her name was no longer Isabella, but Sojourner, and that she felt the calling to become an itinerant preacher. She was 46 years old and had never had a permanent home, so the new name became permanent. As her narrative explains, she was now fairly started on her pilgrimage, her bundle in one hand and a little basket of provisions in the other, and two York shillings in her purse, her heart strong in the faith that her true work lay before her and that the Lord was her director. Making her way across Long Island and up the Connecticut River Valley through to Northampton, Massachusetts, she began giving innumerable speeches against slavery and on behalf of women's rights and kept audiences transfixed. She stood 5 feet 11 inches, spoke in a low voice, and sang with breathtaking beauty. One friend in her narrative reported that Truth's commanding figure and dignified manner hushed every trifler into silence, and her singular and sometimes uncouth modes of expression never provoked a laugh, but often where the whole audience melted into tears by her touching stories. Truth's accomplishments were doubly significant because she was not able to read or write. Her considerable fame rested almost entirely on her speeches, her preaching, and her singing. But in 1846, she began dictating her story to Olive Gilbert, a white abolitionist friend, in hopes of matching the success of Frederick Douglass's narrative of enslavement and emancipation. The publishing of the narrative of Sojourner Truth in 1850 helped publicize her story and enabled her to pay the mortgage on her house in Massachusetts. By 1863, she had resettled in Battle Creek, and beginning that fall, after regaining her health, she spent a great deal of time in Detroit on behalf of the war effort and served as Battle Creek's representative at the Michigan Ladies' Freedmen's Aid Society. Months after the Detroit race riot of March 1863, Truth lectured on prejudice to Methodist children at the state Sabbath school convention in Battle Creek. Children, she said. Who made your skin white? Was it God? Who made mine black? Was it not the same God? Thus, get rid of your prejudice and learn to love colored children that you may all be children of your Father in heaven. In May 1863, feminist activist Frances Dana Barker Gage published a revised version of Truth's Ain't I a Woman speech, originally delivered in Akron, Ohio in 1851. Gage's version of the speech gained widespread popularity and became the version used in history books. Truth's most famous speech lives on as a powerful declaration of female independence. That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. 
and ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man, when I could get it, and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne thirteen children and seen most all sold off to slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Despite her staunch support for the women's rights movement, Sojourner Truth eventually broke with movement pioneers Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony when Stanton stated she would not support the fight for black voting rights if women were still denied the right. The article that made Sojourner Truth most famous was published by Harriet Beecher Stowe, the famous author of Uncle Tom's Cabin in the Atlantic Monthly in 1863. Stowe dubbed Sojourner Truth the Libyan Sybil and made her a national icon of the abolitionist movement. But the article was largely a fiction, one that distorted its subject into a gullible and slightly foolish stereotype who spoke in a crude and almost incomprehensible dialect and overemphasized the naive aspects of her Pentecostal religious faith. Mrs. Stowe laid it on thick, said Sojourner Truth, who refused throughout her life to allow the article to be read to her. Even if Stowe painted a romanticized portrait of her subject, she was right to understand religious faith as the cornerstone of Sojourner Truth's appeal. As historian Nell Irvin Painter explains, her ability to call upon a supernatural power gave her a resource claimed by millions of black women and by disempowered people the world over. Without doubt, it was Truth's religious faith that transformed her from Isabella, domestic servant, into Sojourner Truth, a hero for three centuries at least. Truth died at her home in Battle Creek in 1883 after spending years in a hard-fought attempt to convince the federal government to provide former slaves with land in the West. Though this particular campaign earned only limited success, Truth's battles against various inequalities made her one of the most important women of the 19th century. Truth was a keen and modest judge of her own accomplishments. I have pled with all the force I had that the day might come that the colored people might own their own soul and body. Well, the day has come, although it came through blood. It makes no difference how it came. It did come. Sojourner Truth was a remarkable case, but the Civil War saw many female heroes. During the war, American women threw themselves into public life with an enthusiasm born out of a sense of duty. Nearly 20,000 women worked directly for the Union war effort, and more than 400 women disguised themselves as men in order to fight for the Union and Confederate armies. Through various activities, these pioneers dislodged the idea that women were simply expected to provide a clean home and nurturing environment for husbands and children by joining volunteer brigades, working as nurses, and campaigning against social inequalities, American women were able to expand the prospects of female self-determination. <laughs>